my talk today is called Let Them Write Code. And what I'll be sharing with you is one not so weird trick for building awesome developer tools, which is kind of what we do. And I guess which is also something that many of you do, even if you don't think of yourself as writing developer tools. I would say we're all here because we're either writing code or we're somehow involved in some process that's about writing code. And why do we write code? Well, we mostly write code so other people can use it. Maybe it's other people on your team, maybe the code is gonna go into a product that'll be used by your customers, or maybe you're actually just writing code for future you who's gonna come back to that function you wrote um, in a few months and hope that you've um, documented it properly so you still know how to use it. And um, well, I also write code that's used by other people. Um, some of you might know me from my work on Spacey. Spacey is an open source library for natural language processing in Python. So basically, if you have lots of text and you wanna find out more about that text that goes a bit beyond just searching for keywords, well, then you can use Spacey. And it's, it's always a bit hard to estimate usage for open source projects, but we, we think that we have at least about 100,000 developers using Spacey. And we also have a growing ecosystem of plugins and extensions um, that you can use together with Spacey um, to really make the tool more powerful and extend it with functionality that you want. And the other piece of software that I'm writing is called Prodigy, uh, which is an annotation tool for creating training data for machine learning models. So basically, you know, if you're training a machine learning model, um, you want to always, usually want to show it at least some examples that kind of encode the behavior that you wanted to learn. And for that, you typically need to um, label some examples, try out a few things, um, and run some experiments. And Prodigy makes that easier. And we currently have over 2,500 um, users of the tool. And Prodigy is kind of a hybrid developer tool in that sense because it gives you both um, a modern web app that lets you move through the examples quickly and try lots of things. And it also gets, uh, gives you um, a scriptable backend. Um, so you can you know, really program custom workflows in Python and set up um, you know, your, uh, your workflow and your annotation project exactly the way you want to. Um, we do all of this um, as part of our company, Explosion. Um, we really, we're a developer tools company, so we specialize in building tools for other software developers. And um, uh, this year, we've been able to grow our team, um, and we're currently six developers um, working on you know, different parts of our stack. And when I talk to people, um, I often, <laughs> this is one of the questions I get a lot, which is like, wow, you're such a small team. We used to be only two people, only me and my co-founder, Matt. And how do you get so much done? How do you build all these tools? And like, how do you build all these things that are quite, actually quite useful? How do you do it? And of course, there are like different um, sides to it. But I would say one big part of it is um, that it's really when you're building software, it's, a lot, it's not just about building lots of stuff. Um, it's about what you build and like how you choose to build it. Um, and in our case, by making our tools programmable and extensible, um, we're able to effectively you know, get more done, write less code, while at the same time also making the people using our software a lot happier. And the thing is, well, as de developers write code, and developer tools don't have to replace a developer. Developer tools are supposed to help a developer um, do their work better and be more productive. Um, and ultimately, a developer is always gonna develop, um, but tools um, can help them. And in a way, actually, the worst developer experience are these tools that try to be a fully integrated solution and kind of try to be everything. So maybe you've experienced this at work where you had to use some tool and it, um, you know, it really tried to give you <clears throat> one way to do everything and you couldn't customize it and when you needed a new feature, you had to email support and then wait two weeks so they added a way to load from JSON files instead of CSV, even though you're like, God, if I just had, um, you know, if I could write five lines of Python, I could have done it myself, uh, but no, wasn't possible. Um, and that's usually a type of experience that's like not very useful if you're building software. Like, you know, you can write code, so um, you often, writing code usually makes you happy. 
And yeah, what you can see is that this sort of, this type of software isn't only better for the developers, it's also actually um, significantly cheaper and easier to build. So it's a win-win for both sides. We get, to, um, you know, we get to build software in a way that's very efficient, even with a small team, and our developers get tools that are actually very useful to them. And so when you see this, you might say, well, but if it's a tool for developers, aren't like, all developer tools extensible because you, know, you write code with them? If you can write code, you can extend them, right? But the thing is, yes, in some way, yes, but also um, not, not all libraries provide you with all the uh, composable primitives you need. You can still use a library and interact with code and uh, still kind of have the same problems um, with extensibility and um, uh, efficiency. So I think it's maybe, maybe it's best to show this using a small example. So here's a bit of code. Imagine you've written a library that can take a piece of text and predict um, the part of speech tags in a text. So basically, what's a verb, what's a noun, um, and can give that back to you. And that's like, you know, super useful to find out more about your text. So, you know, you pass it a text, and what you get back are the verbs are, going, swimming, should, and go. That's you know, pretty nice, but also looking at this, you're getting these verbs like are and should, which are also called auxiliary verbs um, that don't really have, you know, don't really express any action. So they're not very useful. So you might want to say, okay, at least I want a setting that lets people exclude these. So I only have the action verbs that, you know, really tell me what's going on here. So that's a bit better. So we have go, swimming, and go. That's nice. Uh, or going, swimming, and go, huh? So. It's kind of the same verb twice. Both going and go have the base form go, so it's kind of the same thing here. So you might as well add um, a little flag that you can set to true um, that resolves all word, uh, words back to their base form, uh, so it's a bit more useful. And now we have go, swim, go. That's pretty good. But um, you have the same word twice, so you might as well um, have a little flag that lets you, if you need it, exclude the duplicates. So you know you have a useful function that does what you want to do, but let's just take a step back um, for a second, look at your function again. Is this, really, is this really the way you want to do it in your library? We already have three different keyword arguments with like pretty cryptic names that are also sometimes a bit hard to spell. I never remember how to spell auxiliaries. Um, and by committing to this sort of API, you're also committing to adding all other methods. You're committing to adding something for all nouns. You're committing to adding all kinds of other keyword arguments for anything else that you might want to do. So maybe that's not um, you know, the most efficient way you're going to do this. And also, you're going to end up with super inconsistent APIs. You have to remember which method takes which arguments. And that's usually pretty annoying. So here's an example of how um, we do this in Spacey. So we, you, know, you, get, you process a text, you get this doc object back, and that doc object holds all the annotations. So all you have to know is how do I access a lemma, how do I access a part of speech tag, and you can write a simple list comprehension that just gets you all the verbs that you want. And OK, if we want to filter duplicates, well, that's luckily something we already have in the programming language we use, because that's called a set. So all you're doing is you call a set around it, and what you get is a list of all verbs. And if you need a list of all nouns, well, you change the part of speech tag here, and you get the same thing. You can customize it, and you don't have to remember a bunch of keyword arguments. But of course, you know, you might say, well, but that does mean I have to write a lot of the same code. Um, and I, if, you know, if I write my software that way and do it, like, I do quite keep ha having to repeat the same code. Um, so you know, things like that. Why can't the library just do things like that? Well, the set of things like that is probably bigger than you think, and it also keeps growing and keeps changing. So you'll have to think of all of that, and that's going to be pretty difficult, because here's a quick example. So another thing that might be super common in your library is that you need to load data. You always need to load text and data from somewhere. So you build this load data function. You, OK, the most common things are JSON, CSV. You might as well do plain text. So you're writing the loaders for that, pretty easy. Then, OK, many users also store text in databases. So you might as well add the most common databases that people use. 
But so as people start using your tool and it becomes more popular, inevitably you're going to get some questions like, oh, does it support MongoDB? MongoDB is quite popular. Um, you know, I can only use it if it supports Mongo. So cool. You go add a loader for Mongo. Now your users happy and they can use MongoDB. But of course. Um, you know, the space is constantly changing, and maybe in a month's time, you have a user asking you, oh, there's this really new framework on the block. It's called UnicornDB. It's a whole new paradigm for um, using databases, and it's like completely different, and it's what all the cool kids use now. Could you please integrate UnicornDB? So, you know, you start um, reading the docs for UnicornDB, start like thinking about the best practices, because as with any new framework, people, you know, use software that promises a new paradigm, they're often also very, very opinionated about um, how you do things. And I feel like also people who are into databases are also usually quite opinionated about how they want their stuff done. So, you know, you don't want to disappoint them. And while you're still reading the docs here, there's a new, a, a yet another new version. There's dual corn DB now, so you also have to support that. And yeah, so if we take if we take another step back here, um, you know, while you're, you know, you're reading the docs for Unicorn DB and Geocorn DB, and you get this sinking feeling that like sooner or later there'll be Tricorn DB that you also have to support, and um, you, you're wasting a lot of time trying to, you know, write things for all these integrations that like your users want, and probably afterwards you get a few angry um, issues on GitHub by um, Duocorn users complaining that you're not following the best practices and they can't use their stuff and that your software sucks. So if instead of doing all of that, we did something like this, that would actually you know, make the developers much easier and solve this problem um, in a much more straightforward way. Because instead of your library taking care of all of this loading, you can just get, let people pass in a function. And so all the very opinionated Unicorn DB users can just write their own function that loads their data and yields um, data in your format that your application can consume. So it's really a win-win, and this is, not, this is not the lazy way. Like, it might feel like, oh, I'm kind of cheating here because I'm letting the user do all the work. But like, from the user's perspective, they're like, great, I don't have to trust some person um, with their implementation. I can just do it. I know how it works. I'll plug that in, and immediately it works for any arbitrary thing I might be using. And if you kind of, if you think outside of the framework, um, it's really, you know, developers, if developers can help themselves, they're much happier than if they have to file a support request. Like, if it, you know, if you can just write a few lines of Python um, to get something done that you want, that's much easier than, um, you know, having a framework that you use support everything. And that also means that the question about what does it support, what can it do, kind of shifts from the idea of does your tool integrate with something towards does, well, can you do whatever you want to do in Python? And that's also often, for example, for our tools like Prodigy, what we tell people, if they're like, oh, does it support, insert some technology here? We're like, well, can you do whatever you want to do in Python? And then people are like, yeah, of course, I, can, I do that all the time. And we're like, well, then um, most likely you'll be able to use it because you can just write a function that does it and plug it in. And put, maybe put in a slightly different way, Mostly, you know, when people think about like um, developing new features and building new things, what people are mostly worried about is reinventing the wheel, which is, you know, a valid concern. You don't want to, you know, keep reinventing the whole thing that already exists and make it harder and like less maintainable. But I think what we really, you know, what's what's much worse and much a much much bigger problem is reinventing the road. You're reinventing the way everything is done, and everyone else has to adapt to how you're doing it and Every question becomes about, well, can I use whatever I want to use on your road? And um, you know, you're defining the constraints. And that's, that's really, I think, um, you know, one of the much bigger concerns that um, you, know, you should keep in mind when developing software. And maybe you know, this might still sound a bit abstract. And so I've prepared a few small examples that show how really you, know, you quite, can quite easily program behaviors in the code that you write in a way that lets other developers um, program your tool and that makes them happy and lets them do what they need. And the most obvious one here is, of course, callback functions. Um, I feel like callback functions, they kind, of, they kind of got a bit of a bad reputation because it's, it's kind of easy to overdo it and make it way too complex and then you end up in callback hell and um, you, kind of, you, know, you don't know what's going on anymore. But I think if it's done well and if it's simple, 
it can be a very, very effective way of um, letting a user do custom stuff within um, yeah, the software you're writing. So, for instance, here we have um, a callback. Uh, we have a function that takes a callback that's called on update, and it receives one argument, which is some status, and lets the user execute any arbitrary code that they might want to execute when that happens. So that's very straightforward. Another example um, is what we call function registries. That's actually something we've started uh, using all across our libraries, um, uh, which is, and basically the idea is that you know you can use, for example, a decorator that's provided by a library that you use, and you can register functions like, in this case, um, a custom loader, assign it a name, and the library knows what to do with it. And um, if you want to load from um, Unicorn, uh, that's all you, know, you have to tell the application. You register your loader, and um, it can just run whatever code. And you don't need to, you know, you don't need to monkey pot patch anything or um, you know, even submit uh, a pull request to hope that someone integrates uh, your stuff. It just can all happen under the hood. And it's also very clean and very independent. So if you, you can write a unit test for that function in your code base that's pretty much completely independent of the library you use and make sure it works. And the next one, that's actually something, I've, I've actually never used this in any of our um, tools, but I'm uh, kind of keen to give it a try. And it's also something that's, yeah, it's a con it's, it's, I think it's kind of little known, a little known concept, even though it's been around since uh, Python 3.4. And the idea here is that often you have functions uh, that take different, um, you know, different input types. It's like, yeah, you know, an argument can be an int or string. And we've, I think normally we've maybe learned that, yeah, this is not good um, and it shouldn't, but like sometimes you can't avoid it. And um, usually what you would then do in your function is you would write some type checks, which again also we all know is kind of difficult and annoying and like also something you shouldn't be doing. Uh, so the idea here is that we actually, um, you get to define different variations for different um, types. So um, in the context of extending an application, you could use this um, to register your own custom types. So of a loader, you want to take, let's say you're working with pandas, which works with data frames. And if the tool you're using doesn't yet support that, you could just register um, a variation for that input type, uh, do, um, make it load a data frame, and then even maybe you want to submit a pull request and like push that upstream. Maybe you don't. Um, but it's basically or you, you know, your unicorn DB object. It's just an easy way um, for the user to extend by writing their own code without having to kind of hack into the library. And the next one, that's actually something we use a lot and I think it's like, it's, it's um, a really great way uh, to make tools um, extensible. And I don't know if you've worked with entry points before, but the idea is that entry points let one Python package advertise a function to another package that's installed in the same environment. So. For example, here we have the entry point spacey factories, um, and, at the, and we de, we, the entry point group, and we define a component and a function that's in our package. And then spacey will, when it spacey loads, spacey will check what entry points are advertised by other packages. And if they exist, they're going to be loaded. And that's all going to happen automatically if you have these packages installed. So you basically, you don't have to call into Spacey, you don't have to call, you know, you don't have to register anything. It just works and it's also a great way for one library to inter easily interoperate with a lot of the library. Um, and probably maybe one, um, you've, you might have heard of it um, by the console scripts, which is typically how you, you know, register command line scripts. But you can also use that for like completely custom uh, functionality and I think it's pretty cool. And finally, one thing that we see um, a lot, which I think introduces a lot of unwanted complexity, is um, if your library or your code uh, takes, completely takes over the I.O., so loading the data, for example, it takes a file path and opens the file and does everything um, automatically. Because that means, you know, if you don't want to load from a file, you have to create a temporary file, you have to write to disk, um, and all of that is pretty annoying. So instead, if you can make it, either take an open file or if you can actually make it take the config, you can say, hey, look, um, loading from a JSON file, loading from a YAML file, all of that is a solved problem. Uh, let's let the user open a file. If they don't know how to do it, they can probably find an answer online very easily, and your library doesn't have to deal with all of that that can potentially you know, cause problems. And 
to give you, you know, something, an example of this in action, here's um, the recipe script from our library, Prodigy, again. And we also, one thing we do here is, well, we have, an, um, we have a decorator that registers a function. So by just adding Prodigy recipe, um, we can tell Prodigy, hey, this is um, a recipe called my recipe, and it'd be available on the command line. And you can also use entry points for that. So another thing we do is we let the users load their files. If they need to load from CSV, maybe they need to load from Unicorn DB. We don't care. Um, we can provide some helpers for this, but um, the, user, the user can load f um, data however they want. Ultimately, all we want is an iterable of dicts. It can be a list. It can be a generator. Um, Prodigy doesn't care. Uh, you, just, yeah, you just need to provide it somehow. And how you, how you provide it is up to you. If it's a generator function, you can use a model in the loop. You can respond to external state. Um, and as long as you yield um, dictionaries in the same format, you can use them and set it up how you want. And we also give you, a, there's also a callback function example here. So this function is called whenever we receive new answers or new annotations from the server. And that can execute anything from logging state to updating a model. Um, and we just pass that in. And if it's there, and uh, Prodigy can use it. But the um, aspect of the tool that I think has really made it easier to develop these things and support a variety of use cases, and I also think that if you're building tools that other people use, this can really make it easier for you to get more done, focus on doing the actual development work, and uh, make the users happier. But of course, there's always, you know, you're usually, if you're developing software, you're usually not um, the only person making the decisions. And even if you as a developer think, hey, that's how we should do it, let's spend less time on trying to build every little feature and like build something that our users can extend, um, program, and work with. There's still, you know, there might be other people you have to convince and you might, um, you know, get some pushback. So, how do you really convince uh, your company, your team, uh, whoever else, other stakeholders that like, um, you know, you should. We should be uh, approaching developer tools that way. Oh, so one thing, one thing you might hear, like someone might say, is like, well, okay, so this all like all this code and stuff, and all these like writing things. It's not, it's not that much code, but like it still looks really complicated. And if a system is just easier, and we just have a few buttons, that's just so much easier to demo. If you, you know, want to demo it internally to your team, maybe to a customer, maybe you're selling software. So, um, you know, why can't we just make it easier so it's easier to demo? And the thing is, if the audience of the tool is developers. And you can you know, get the developers involved. That's gonna, really going to be a win-win situation for both sides. And we, we also see this a lot with Prodigy. That, like, we often, you know, if we do demos or show, show the tool to developers, they're like, oh, great. It's finally, you know, I can see how I can program with it. And I can see how I can use it. And that's much more valuable than like, showing something that's really, really simple to management who thinks, oh, yeah, like, our developers can click two buttons, and then they're done. Well, it's never that easy. So we've already we've heard from many developers who are like, oh, this is who ended up going with Prodigy, and like, this is so much nicer than a lot of other solutions they were demoed um, that really focused way too much on the simplicity of usage, and um, yeah, from a developer perspective, just look like, well, can you really, you know, how, how do I extend them? Do I always have to file support requests? Um, sounds difficult. So if you and if you're selling software. The other thing is, well, um, you know, you want to you want to win customers, and you also want to want the customers to be happy. And your customers are always going to ask for features. Your customers want stuff, and um, the best way to make your customers happy is to give them the stuff they want, right? So you build if you build everything that your customer asks for, they're going to be happy. But once you go down that path and say, okay, I'm just going to you want a feature, I'm going to build that feature, you're really selling an all or nothing approach and you really and if the user says well I don't want all I just want like parts of it I already have a solution for this I already have a solution for that they kind of have to go for nothing and yeah you can tell them hey look that one part that's actually not so important like you don't have to use that but that, that sounds pretty bad as well and to, to the user this what this communicates is well I'm kind of locked in here and I have to go I have to take the whole thing and it's really it really wants me to do everything on that platform. And that's actually often for, in the developer space, not that um, desirable. And finally, well, another thing you want if you are building software is that you want your tool to be easy to learn. You don't want people to have to spend forever to try to understand what you're doing. So if you, we have all this other 
you know, Python stuff, and if the user has to think about, like, oh, what's um, a decorator, and like, oh, I have to, you know, um, return a list here, how do I do that again? Doesn't, doesn't this actually make it harder to learn, and shouldn't you, like, you know, want to avoid writing your tools that way? Well, the thing is, background knowledge is actually, background knowledge is not the problem. The problem, what's hard to learn is, your is the tool-specific stuff. Background knowledge, like the programming language we're already working in, that's actually pretty easy to learn, and it also generalizes well across other tasks. Um, and there are lots of great resources. So, you know, I'm sure, for example, in, 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 a, in the audience here, I'm sure there are like some, some, some of you have never worked with decorators before, because it was just never relevant to you. And I'm also sure there are lots of you who um, have never worked with any of our software before, or use Spacey or Prodigy, but totally know what a decorator is and could probably explain the other group of people what this is and how you use it. Same with um, a generator function. Or you can type that into Google and you find lots of threads on Stack Overflow that explain you that concept and it's completely independent of the tool. And from the developer perspective, um, I, it, the, the burden of documentation is not on me. I don't have to explain to you how to, how to create an object that my library needs. I can tell you, hey, it's, this, it's a function that returns this, and however you put it together, it's up to you. If you don't understand the concept, Google it, ask someone, um, and you'll be able um, to, find, to learn about it without me having to give you every single piece, and if I don't, uh, you're struggling. And so if we're talking about you know, programming, uh, you know, like one, one thing people discuss a lot, which I think is very valid, is um, making technology accessible and inclusive and also um, you know, democratizing technology so that like, everyone can use it and it's not just like, reserved for like, a group of people with like, certain skills. So you know, if, we, if I'm actually telling you here, like, you, look, you, people should write more code and let your users write code, make your users write code, isn't that exclusive and doesn't that like, um, you know, exclude people who can't program? What, you know, what are we doing here? And the thing is, well, even, you know, people, even people who can't um, program can still benefit from an ecosystem of tools if they're programmable. And like, if you're talking about, oh, people who can't program, there's always this, lots of people see this as, a, as kind of a hierarchy of, oh, pe pe um, you know, some people can program and they can use all these complex tools and then there are other people who can't and they don't deserve like powerful tools. And of course, um, that's not true. Often people who, um, you know, want to use these very advanced developer tools and maybe haven't learned to program yet because whatever, they're often also very experienced professionals in another field, like medical, for example, or legal, uh, digital humanities, all of these fields, you have professionals that want to work with highly um, specialized tools and just don't happen to know Python. And there might, might still be people in their groups and people in uh, their field who can program. And in that sense, your, a tool you write can still be very useful for these people in a way that you could have never anticipated. Like, you can't know every single use case and every single thing people are trying to do with your software. And ultimately, you know, it also comes down to, you know, you realizing that, like, you're not going to think of everything. And to, to have the humility to accept that and instead of trying to provide one tool to rule them all, um, allow people to extend it um, and accept that, like, um, you know, you can either ship them an incomplete uh, version or not. And, you know, and there's no, for people, you know, if you want to, if, if people are using your tools, just giving people an interface that they can click on does not solve any of the problems because by just putting a button on top of it of something that's fundamentally um, a tool to program, you're just giving people an abstraction and every abstraction leaks. An abstraction is always going to be worse than, uh, in, that, in that sense, this type of abstraction is always going to be worse than, like, the actual thing. And it's sort of, you know, you're not helping someone who can't program by giving them a leaking, ab leaky abstraction over something um, that's fundamentally uh, programmable. And let's maybe give you, you know, a simple example that actually might even seem, look a bit appealing at first. So here we have, um, a machine learning model builder. So imagine, you know, you're training models and, um, you know, normally you do that in code, but you want to make it a bit easier for people to use. So you've built, um, you know, this little UI, people can select 
an embedding layer, an encoding layer, people can upload their data, um, tune some hyperparameters, and then they can click a button and they can train a model. I mean, looks useful, right? But, you know, if we kind of, if we take a step back again here, ultimately, you know, what we've built here does not actually solve any problem on any level. If you're a developer and you're writing the code, this is not going to help you because as soon as you want to add a print statement or log something or uh, change something, um, you can't do that. You need to add another drop down. You add an need to add another field. Um, and if you, you know, if you could just write one line of code instead, that would be much more efficient than working with a tool like that. And on the other hand, if you know, if you want people um, who are maybe not machine learning developers to be able to train a machine learning model, well, that's um, I know, that's a nice idea, and that's interesting. But giving them some, giving them kind of this simple interface, which is just like an abstraction over your code, that's kind, that's almost an insult to any professional working with, um, you know, these tools. Because there's a lot more that you need to do in order to really make things useful. And I would say that maybe, you know, with the technology, we might not quite be quite there yet to make it, um, you know, useful enough to offer this kind of abstraction. So, um, you know, a business professional shouldn't have to care about your encoding layer. Um, a business professional cares about like very different things. So this interface, would, this interface and this, this kind of approach to things doesn't really solve any problem and it's just strictly worse than letting people program um, and building systems that way. And so, you know, when we think about uh, making technology accessible, making things accessible to people who aren't like you is not just trying to think of everything they might want and then giving it to them. Again, that's what I mean. It's kind of, you know, you're never going to think of everything. Um, there's no way you can know what, um, you know, a specialist in a different field uh, might want. And um, so dividing, also, so dividing people up into coders and non-coders really isn't that helpful. There are many professional tools, for example, just think of Excel. People use Excel, people write formulas in Excel, and yeah, maybe that's not coding, but it's still something people want to use, and people um, use that so those sorts of behaviors to get their job done. People want complex uh, systems, and people want complex behaviors, and even if at some point it means, yeah, they have to write one or two lines of Python, that's still more useful than having to rely on you to give them a checkbox they can click on. So, and if we look at this, from you know the perspective of okay, what what does this mean for software and what like lessons uh, can we learn um, here? Is if we look at open source software, it's pretty interesting that like open source tools have comp have again and again crushed closed source software in many many fields and many many domains. And that's even though open source has like a pretty pretty significant disadvantage over uh, closed source proprietary software, which is often open source tools have a lot less money. Sometimes you know they have company like in our case we have a company behind it. Sometimes people take donations. O many open source tools are very community driven and. Um, can actually be quite unorganized. Sometimes it's you know some guy developing it in his free time, and still companies are using it. And why is that? Well, people often talk about, oh, it's because it's free, and companies you know companies just like using free stuff. But I think that's not that's not true. I mean, it, it could be you know it can be a motivation, and it makes the entry entry barrier um, easier. But companies can totally pay for stuff. But people like the fact that open source tools are programmable and extensible. That's something people really value about software in general. And that's also, that's I think a big part that contributes to the success of open source. And this is also something we can learn from the success of open source software. And I'm not saying all you need to do is like make your software open source. It's completely fine to make money. It's fine to build closed source systems. But if you want to take one lesson away from this, um, when you are next time, you know, you're sitting down and building a tool, building a piece of software that other people are going to use. Um, learn this lesson, make it programmable, make it extensible, try to focus less on making things easy, and instead just let your users write code. Thank you. Um, so I had a question. Ah. I'm here. Ah, there. Yeah. So in your entire talk, you were talking about how to make it easier for developers to add features on the go. 
what's your take on high level rappers that go on top of your apis in this kind of an environment um sorry i didn't i didn't get the last part of the question what's your uh, take on high level rappers that go around apis for example keras stuff like that how do you think high level rappers uh, play into making your apis easier to use okay so you mean you know high, high level rappers like keras and um what they contribute to making tools easier to use yeah okay good perfect now sorry the, the acoustics are a bit dif difficult and i ke keep hearing an echo so it's not it's not about you um so yes actually um mentioning keras and also tensorflow actually it's a good example i didn't mention that in a talk but um especially with tensorflow 2 i think they really just like pytorch went for this concept where you have the low level primitives that you can use but also you have a more high level api that does the more common tasks that people might want to do and i do think this is if you can maintain it and if you can pull it off i think that can be a good compromise but but actually you know you want to be exposing the primitives for people to work with and they actually need to be usable and then you can still say hey if you know i can give you a fit method that trains your model but i also give you all the parts you can use for your training loop the only thing i would say you have to consider there is that okay a large library like tensorflow can pull this off but if you want to do it you know both parts need to be good if your primitives are kind of hard to use outside of your wrappers that's pretty difficult but if you can do it um that's a good way and that that way every time a user needs something custom you can say okay you are like past the point of using out of the box now here are all the primitives now you can put them together yourself here's the documentation uh, have fun so yes that's i think a good example so uh, if i understand correctly prodigy is an closed source to um e Yes and no so prodigy is like prodigy is a um a commercial tool so uh it's not open source and free but um we do include parts of the source um that are not compiled python with a library and we also let you write custom python scripts so ideally you can interact with a tool via these recipe scripts and use the components and uh compose uh your workflows in code so the programmable api is still exposed via python <laughs> I'm sorry. So the pro So the programmable API is still exposed via Python. Yeah, so um it's still, you know, you can still you pip install the library um into your environment, which means you can import its components from your script and write your own scripts using the library. Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah because I think it's Ah, uh, hi. Okay. Uh, uh, myself here. Ah, there, yeah. Thank you for a wonderful session. Uh my question is regarding Spacey NER. uh if the data is in uh, sentence form then we can uh, directly go ahead and recognize entities based on the context but what if my data contains single word in each line so how can i use ner in that and how do spacey ner learns context from it okay, okay i mean yeah so that, that it, that's a bit more tangential we can probably also talk about more details later but um fundamentally so you just have one single word yes yes, yes. i mean in that case the thing is if you named entity recognition by definition is you know the idea of recognizing names and context co names and concepts and usually that happens in context and so for context you need context and that's also how the models are typically designed they decide is apple a company or fruit based on the surrounding context if you have no surrounding context then any are and kind of you know that idea of modeling your task is also not very useful Uh, okay and yeah. even in uh, sentence format do the number of spaces between words matter uh, for recognizing the entities so you mean what what the space the number of spaces the other 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 words around it yes yes yeah. yes um well yes so usually you know mod models have different windows in our case it's like four words on either side so that's kind of what the model looks like and that's also you know usually what you want because that context tells you a lot more about you know the words you're looking for so yes okay that's thank it. you hi Uh so when you were conceptualizing when the explosion team was conceptualizing prodigy as a product and through the development process how do you decide what components to make open source or to even expose and what components to you know to to keep as the key points for it as a product Yeah I mean in our case so one part was okay that we also we use we compile some of the code so um you know if it's if it has like C extensions or something and it's be compiled then that's a bit harder to just expose and have you edit um but you know more generally we um we thought well okay there's some um 
they're basically all, all the building blocks that basically modify functionality that um, people might change or also that we might want to um, you know vary like for example how a stream of incoming examples is sorted how you know certain config options are defined or how the model is read in that's all something that we know a user might want to customize and then there's other stuff that just powers some of the internals that's also much less relevant to change in a sense because that's really okay that's the core functionality of how the tool all fits together that's the stuff that we're like well okay we don't need to expose all the details or then again stuff also actually stuff that where we feel like look we just i'm not an expert on either you know rest apis or databases you know i can write that stuff and i would say we did a pretty good job in prodigy but i wouldn't um consider myself like especially opinionated enough to tell someone how to do it so we're like call the web server and the database we have a pretty good implementation but if you don't like it we give that to you open source because i i can totally imagine that someone wants to change that and i think just admitting that is fine like look you built something good but i can understand you might want to do it differently and so here it is <laughs> Um, edit it. Hello. So, hey. hi. Uh, I wanted to know, like, uh, when writing libraries, and sometimes we use decorators and all, and if we want to use some protected variable of some other class or, say, some input we are getting. For example, I was writing a decorator to print logs that uh, your function, like, uh, just logs that entered into this function, and I wanted to write that exit of this function and these are the outputs or these are the arguments that are passed. I needed to use the protected variables and dot function name and all. Is this okay to use the protected variables of a class or not a good practice? I mean, um, so wait, can you summarize the question again? I'm not sure I got the whole. Yeah, so uh, like if you pass a class or object, so yep. is it okay to use protected variables in our library or it's um, so not what, a good practice? What, so. what, what variables? Protected variables, like uh, if an object, like we define in Python by double underscore. Mm. So is it okay to use it in our library if someone else's a user is passing or not a good practice? I mean. Oh, I mean, I, I don't know if I have an opinion on that, to be honest. Like, I do feel like, um, I don't know, in general, every, you know, you'd want to avoid too many arbitrary names you hard code because that's just more stuff that a user has to you know yeah. remember but like i don't i don't think i i have a have an opinion on that but you know it, it does sound a bit like you know having you know, protective variables and stuff it, it does sound a bit inconvenient to have um you know too many of these conventions that you come up with in your own okay. uh, code base like for example or even you telling me that i'm like I'm, I'm actually trying to imagine like how this would look in code and like mm -hmm. how i would interact with this so that you know that could be a bad sign but like honestly i, I don't think i can give you a good good advice <laughs> Okay. Sorry. And yeah, also I yep. wanted to know what is your, uh, in Spacey, what is your work culture like? like how is the work divided and how you guys uh, divide the task and work? Like. Oh, oh, so you mean how, how we um, divide up what to yeah. work on? I mean, at this point, of course, it's a bit easier because we already have a library. We have, um, we've validated a lot of the ideas we've had about like how to compose things. So that um, becomes a bit easier because you know we see we have our roadmap and then we decide okay we now we're now a team of four, four developers who are on the spacey core team everyone kind of has their own uh, strengths and like areas that they're working on so um yeah that's that's now i would say relatively easy by like just okay talking about it and actually another thing we do in spacey is spacey is very it's sort of driven by very few authors. And while we love you know, community contributions, and especially in the area of l extending the languages and really using people's expertise, we don't necessarily expect our community to work it on like some in-depth features and like contribute stuff where you know, we have a clear idea and we think, OK, we can pull this off and develop it. So we're like, you know, it's, we talk about it in the open, but um, we still, ultimately, we figure it out and do it. And, um, presented to the community for feedback. Yeah. Um, what's your view on, you, you mentioned entry points, right? Entry points, yeah, yeah. Can you speak yeah. up a tiny bit? I, I'm having trouble. Yeah, how about this? Yeah, yeah perfect. Uh, so you mentioned entry points, yeah. right? So let's think about a tool like a uh, command line tool like click. Click yep. or a uh, configuration tool like Dynacons. So most of the entry points go through this import path head. So let's say you have nested directories. And if your configuration file or the function which is in the module, which comes into the entry point, often it encounters an import 
problem. Right? If so, you package um, sorry, can you like the, I, I missed the last part? Sorry. So if you package the yep. file, right? Often it enters this uh, import problem, right? Through Python path. So <laughs> what are your opinions on that? So when yeah. you expose entry points, and then you have modules, and within modules you got sub modules, and then specific functions within those sub modules. Often that causes problems, right? Import yeah. errors. And okay, so yeah, yeah. So you, the question is, well, um, how to deal with like bugs and problems yeah, in like? Usually, have you encountered anything like this while building? It? Yeah. So, so if you, you know, if you have entry points um, and ev everything like advertises them, you kind of end up with these problems with like several layers deep of what it registers. Like, yes, I can see that's a valid concern, and of course, you could also you could just publish a package on PyPy that like. Um, advertises really terrible entry points for Spacey and then like mess up everyone's uh, Spacey installation. That's that is true, and that, that's I would say get, um, um, a fault with this approach, like or potential problem with this approach. Also, you know, I guess as a library developer, you probably want to do you know some scaffolding around it to make sure that you're not loading something that's terrible. Um, but yes, that's something you have to consider. Um, probably writing some good error messages around that, and maybe also. I don't know. I haven't. I'm not an expert on like the development on entry points, but I could imagine that maybe also um, that could be something that could maybe be improved in the future and have more features added to the packaging. So yeah. Yeah, in this. Uh, so that was a great talk, and Thanks. I loved uh, all the uh, designs of your slides. <laughs> So my question to you is: uh, Does support uh, does uh, Prodigy support longer text with new lines? Uh, what? Sorry. Uh, does Prodigy support longer text with new lines? Longer texts with new lines. Yeah. Um, so um, in general, yes, because whatever you can you know render on the screen, you can render. Like there's one thing: if you if you're labeling manually, new lines can be kind of tricky because um, the Difficult things here are that like new lines are Unicode characters, so you always need to see them in your text. And one problem um, with visualizing new lines is that well, they're usually kind of invisible; they just create a new line. So we have to, you know, add a bit of um, hackiness to actually display new lines as new line characters, because otherwise it's way too easy to accidentally highlight a new line and really mess up um, your training data that way. Um, but in general, if you in Input text has new lines in it, um, at least one new line you can visually render and see and highlight or avoid highlighting. So um, that's typically no problem, although um, you know, I would often recommend if your texts are very long, have lots of new lines, you don't always, ben it do you don't always benefit from sh looking at the whole text unless you really know what you're doing and your model implementation is actually sensitive to the whole text. Otherwise, you might as well cut it up and use shorter pieces. But we can also talk about some of the details later. So uh, this is the last question um, from this guy. Yeah. 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 Uh, thanks for the talk. Thanks. I have a question specifically on API design. So one headache that happens is sometimes your API is too low level, and the, you know you can do everything with it, but you have to do everything, or it's too high level where you don't have to do everything and you can't do anything. Yeah. So have you? Do you have any thoughts on finding the right abstraction? That's the first part. The second part is, suppose you make a mistake, how do you do version 2 of the API without screwing yeah. all your customers? Oh, th those are both like really good questions. So I mean, the first one, well, it's kind of what the, two, the trade-offs I try to cover in the talk. Often, it, of course, it helps to have users. Like, you know, sometimes you might see it's always better to start maybe a bit too low level. And if users want more, you can gradually add something more. Once you have like all of these helpers that do everything, rolling that back into a more low-level functionality is often a bit too difficult. So I do think having people use it um, and then kind of slowly move towards like um, kind of a good compromise. But that's definitely one of the challenges. And if you can solve that, I think you have a good tool. Second, yeah, backwards compatibility. That's that's difficult, and that's also why uh, it's a it's not the best advice. But try to make good decisions and try to make as little mistakes as possible and you know you need to be right um, but also I would now when I'm writing APIs I'm trying to already think about what what am I going to do if I ever want to roll this back can I easily do that and often I feel like if I come up with a design that's e where it's easy to manage the backwards compatibility it also often means that um, it's overall a better 
API design, or once you end up with like random combinations of keyword arguments that uh, might not be valid anymore in the future, that's, I would say, often already kind of a very questionable design that you uh, want to avoid. Or, you know, if you rename something, want to change something, can I just raise an error message here, direct the users to something else, um, and it's done. But yeah, I can definitely, I can relate to all of these questions, of course.